Welcome everyone. I'm Janice Castrogave, VP at Clarius. Today we're excited to welcome back the fabulous veterinary ultrasonographer educator, Dr. Camilla Edwards, for the live webinar on practical small animal ultrasound. In this session, you'll learn point of care scanning techniques for the kidney and urinary bladder. During the next hour, you'll see both step-by-step -step video and live veterinary ultrasound scanning to hone your skills. Dr. Edwards will teach how to perform kidney and bladder exams using the latest advancements in wireless ultrasound with our new third generation Claria scanners. We'll compare healthy to abnormal anatomy so you can learn to quickly and accurately evaluate and measure the severity of hydronephrosis to rule out masses and stones and to monitor progress during treatment. Today's session is race approved thanks to the vet show. So please do stay on for the full hour to qualify for one CE CPD credit, which you'll be able to redeem via the vet show in the coming days. I'd like to thank all 4,100 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's popular event. You're in for a highly practical session with Dr. Edwards, followed by live scanning with Mountain, our favorite poodle here at Clarius. Mountain will be scanned by your host, Shelly Gunther, following the presentations. Let me introduce you now to, to Shelly. Shelly Gunther is an experienced sonographer and recently joined us as clinical marketing manager at Clarius. She has over 25 years of experience as a clinical ultrasound expert with deep experience in both general ultrasound and echocardiography. At Clarius, Shelly is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice, delivering practical webinars like today and video tutorials for our Claris classroom, which now features over 100 on-demand videos. Join me in welcoming Shelly. Hi, Shelly. Hi, thanks so much, Janess. Wow, 4,100 registrants, that's incredible. <laughs> it's uh, really great to be hosting another webinar with Dr. Edwards. She and her dog, Pippi, have provided lots of good information um, in prior web webinars, and I know there'll be lots of great content for you um, that you can all take back to your practices today. Now we've covered other veterinary topics um, in ultrasound, but it seems that thanks to passionate ultrasound experts like Dr. Edwards, the possibilities are really endless. Today, the focus is going to be on the canine urinary system. With uh, improved resolution of smaller ultrasound systems, as well as specialized veterinary scanners and presets, the kidneys and the bladder can easily be visualized in small animals and abnormalities can be picked up more often thanks to ultrasound. There's more information becoming available in the literature. I like this paper, which was written by a fellow sonographer who specializes in veterinary ultrasound. She describes how ultrasound has become an essential imaging modality in veterinary medicine, particularly in small animals. And we certainly see this expanding as the experience of ultrasound users increases. Ultrasound is fast, non-invasive and can really add valuable information to aid in diagnostics and treatment. And pertinent to our webinar today, this literature review looks at how ultrasound examination has become the key element in the workup of patients with urinary signs because of its ability to easily assess the kidneys and the urinary bladder. And the ease of assessment in the hands of ultrasonographers that have even just a little bit more experience. And this review is actually from 2018. So I'm gonna assume that with uh, more vets using ultrasound in recent years and gaining more experience that we'll continue to see ultrasound being used more routinely and uh, there'll be more articles written. And finally, this article describes how valuable POCUS can be in emergency situations for both diagnosis and tracking in an unstable azotemic patient. POCUS exam can help direct the investigation specific to the signs and symptoms and expedite the diagnoses for this and many other conditions. The kidneys can be a source of many abnormalities, both congenital and acquired, acute and chronic. Abnormalities of the kidneys and ureters are commonly seen when the urinary bladder abnormalities are present. The urinary bladder is easily visible with ultrasound, particularly when the bladder is a little distended. And in some cases, the prostate and the urethra can be visualized and evaluated. Dr. Edwards will demonstrate her systematic approach to examine the urinary system. And this will include how to locate the kidneys and bladder and what to look for in assessing their ultrasound appearance. 
And in contrast to that, she'll be showing us some pathological conditions so that we um, are better equipped to know what to look for. So before we jump into the meat of the webinar here, we're interested to know if you don't already use ultrasound in your practice, why is that? Is it because ultrasound equipment's more expensive? Is it because it's difficult to perform? Is it the lack of ultrasound experience and therefore the lack of confidence in your diagnosis or even just image assessment? Is it because there's a lack of training options or you don't think you need ultrasound in your practice at all? So we'll just wait a couple of minutes for the poll to uh, come in here. Okay. So we don't have sonography experience in-house. Well, that's good. When I have to say that, uh, you know, that that just comes with with practice and practice. And, uh, you know, we're really sure and um, we hope that the information in this webinar will help you to real, realize that ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder is extremely useful and doable. And with some instruction and practice, perhaps something that you'll be adding to your practice. So I can't think of anyone better to bring us today's topic than Camilla Edwards, who we're happy to have back. Dr. Edwards graduated from KBL in Denmark in 2006, and she worked in general practice and emergency critical care in the UK. She achieved a certif certificate in advanced veterinary practice in 2018, and she started her company First Opinion Veterinary Ultrasound in 2018, where she scans for general practice in the UK, reviews ultrasound, machines, teaches ultrasound, and runs a very active Facebook community with over 2,000 vets interested in ultrasound. Dr. Camilla, we're going to hand it over to you now for the webinar. Thanks very much, Shelley, for that warm welcome. I'm really pleased to be back talking with you guys again. So today we're going to talk about um, kidneys and bladder. Um, just have to declare my conflict of interest. I'm receiving an honorarium for this uh, webinar and I re receive a flat commission for any ultrasound machines sold through my website. And that includes the Clarius machine. So what are we gonna learn in this webinar? We're gonna look at uh, what the indications are for scanning the kidney and the bladder in, in uh, our dogs and cats specifically how to find the left kidney, the right kidney, there's slightly different techniques, um, and how to look at the bladder. And we really want to be sure that we've scanned the entire organ. Um, so I'm gonna show you a systematic approach to scanning all of those. And then we're gonna look at a bit of pathology in a few cases um, that we'll see. We are assuming uh, a little bit of ultrasound knowledge, um, some basic knowledge about ultrasound machine setup and your basic anatomy. So we'll start with the kidneys. The indications for scanning the kidneys include any changes in urination. So uh, changes in frequency of urination, changes in behavior around urination or changes um, in, in its appearance. So if we have pyuria or hematuria or proteinuria um, as well, if those are showing up on, um, on, on urinalysis. Any raised blood values around um, the kidneys, so urea and creatinine, for example, if they are raised. Um, and for example, if we have a palpable mass in the, in the cranial abdomen. Also, importantly, if we have pyrexia of unknown origin, it's always worth scanning those, those kidneys um, as well. So a brief um, little bit about kidney anatomy that we'll, we'll see on, on ultrasound scanning. So we'll have the, the cortex around the outside and then we, we can see the medulla and that's really obvious the difference between those on ultrasound. And then we've, we've got the pelvis um, disappearing off into the ureter um, that, that can also be seen as well as the blood vessels within the kidney. What are you looking for specifically? So we talk about looking at, at the length of the kidneys. Um, that, that's what most um, papers uh, that, that look at uh, are looking out for pathology. We look at the length. So in cats, we're, we're looking for a kidney that's between 3.8 and 4.4 centimeters long. That's considered normal. 
And with dogs, it obviously depends on the size of the dog. So um, some, some key markers are if you've got a five kilo dog, you're looking at about four and a half centimeter long kidney. And if you've got a 30 kilo dog, then we're looking at more like a seven centimeter kidney. Um, and then we, we're looking for the kidneys, their anatomical location. So the left is more caudal than the right. The right is usually under the rib cage, whereas the left is, is just behind the rib cage. Some normal ultrasound artifacts that we will see um, when we're scanning the kidneys include refraction from the curved surface of the kidney. So the sound waves just bounce off the curved, curved surface of, of the kidney and leaving a bit of a dark hole triangle um, to the sides of the kidneys. Um, and that's quite normal. Um, whereas a, a typical sign of pathology that we might be looking out for is if there's any mineralization or uroliths, then we might see some um, acoustic shadowing below a hyperechoic area in the, within the kidney. So I'll show you a, a little video about how to scan the left kidney. So I start just behind the ziffy sternum, um, looking at, at the liver, pointing cranially, and I go past the stomach here, past the spleen. I'm just following the rib cage up dorsally, but pointing cranially past the spleen. And then the next organ I get to is the left kidney. So often it's not quite the right angle, and I need to just rotate slightly just to get the longest view I can. And once I'm happy with that, I will freeze and then measure the length of the, the kidney. I like to repeat that three times um, and then take the longest length that I gained as the true length, um, because that's going to be the most accurate. We're most likely to underestimate the length of the kidney. Once I've fanned through in both directions, I've viewed the whole kidney in that, that longitudinal plane, I rotate the probe 90 degrees to get a transverse view of the kidney and we get this U-shaped pelvic area here. This a very thin anechoic line is the pelvis um, and it should be almost invisible in a normal dog. So then we, we fan in both directions again um, to, to make sure that we've seen the whole kidney in two different planes. And Dr. Edwards, I know that you mentioned that, that you measure the, the, the length of the kidney. Do you, do you know, is there any value from, from your experience to measuring it in cross-section, like to get a volume calculation? No, it's not something that, that we do routinely. Um, okay. Most of the papers that, that um, I know of focus on the length of the kidney um, as, the, as the key factor. So, um, you know, you can get large kidneys if you've got an acute reaction going on in the kidney or usually a shrunken smaller kidney if we've got something more chronic going on. And I guess that'll just be reflected in the length anyways. Yes, then, right? yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So just to recap, getting looking at the left kidney, we had Pippi in right lateral recumbency and we followed the costal arch from the ziffy sternum past the liver, stomach and spleen. And then we get to the left kidney. Um, so we just rotate ever so slightly to find the longest view of the left kidney and we take measurements three times um, and then take the longest measurement as the true measurement. We fan through dorsally and ventrally, followed by rotating 90 degrees to get the transverse view and fanning through cranial to caudal. So now looking at how to scan the right kidney. Again, we're going from the ziffy sternum, but this time we're in left lateral recumbency. And we are also pointing cranially, following that costal arch all the way up um, to the most dorsal aspect. And this time we're, we're aiming a little bit even more cranial. So right under the rib cage, um, it's often a bit more superficial than people imagine. So here we've got the right kidney. Again, we take three measurements to try and get the most accurate um, measurement we can of the kidney, taking the longest one as the true measurement. And we fan through in both directions. So we've seen it in the longitudinal plane. Then we rotate the probe 90 degrees 
to get the transverse view before fanning through again in two directions. That one definitely looks a little more challenging. Do you ever go in from in between the ribs? Is you, that can go, you can go from in between the ribs. Um, obviously rib shadows can cause a problem there because you might not be able to see the full length of the kidney because mm. the rib shadows may be blocking that. Um, so yes, that's definitely an option. And particularly in dogs that are um, very deep chested where a lot of the, the abdominal organs are much more further cranial than, than that sometimes can become a ne necessity to do it between the ribs. So to see the right kidney, we have Pippi lying in left lateral recumbency. We follow the costal arch to the lumbar musculature and remember to look further cranially than you did with the left kidney. We just rotate slightly to get the longest view of the left kidney, take three measurements as before, and then fan through dorsally and ventrally before rotating the probe 90 degrees and fanning through cranially and caudally. So here are some normal ultrasound images of the kidney. So we've got the, um, the kidney here. Um, we've got the, the cortex, which is hyperechoic compared to the medulla, which is um, much darker, hypoechoic in comparison. And then we've got the transverse view here. And here in the transverse view, we get a nice image of the sort of U-shaped pelvis here. Um, and we've got this very thin um, black line. Um, and and if, the, um, if, if, for example, the ureter is blocked, um, this, this will develop into um, a larger black area full of, full of fluid um, and we'll end up getting hydronephrosis that will end up taking over the whole kidney um, if there's a severe blockage in the ureter. So things we're looking out for pathology wise, we're looking out for nephrolithiasis. Um, so as with any mineralized structure, we'll get a hyperechoic area with an acoustic shadow below it. Um, as I mentioned before, hydronephrosis. So if that pelvis is, is increased in, in size, then, then we've got to look out for a blockage um, further down the urinary tract. We're looking for renal parenchymal disease. So is there anything um, odd about the, the um, parenchyma? Is the echogenicity as we, we'd expect it? Are there focal areas where there's, there's um, changes? We see renal cysts quite often. Um, sometimes um, it can involve the whole kidney and it may be um, quite significant, but often we'll see the odd individual cyst and these are often incidental findings and don't have much implication for the animal's health. Renal infarcts, we'll talk about a little bit later. And re renal neoplasia is also something that we see fairly commonly as well. So we'll move on to the bladder. So indications for scanning the bladder are much the same as for the kidneys. Um, so we're talking about changes in urination, changes around the behavior in urination, um, frequency, um, how, how the urine looks, um, and also changes if we um, perform urinalysis and we find pyuria, hematuria, or proteinuria. But also in particular, those cases um, where we see unresolved cystitis. So um, if a cystitis case uh, um, presents to you and it hasn't resolved fairly quickly on, um, on conservative treatment, then it's always worth getting um, an ultrasound probe on that bladder. The artifacts we might see around the urinary bladder um, that are normal include refraction from the curved surface of the bladder wall. Um, much as with the kidneys, because you've got this curved surface, the ultrasound waves might bounce off the, the bladder wall um, and can even make it appear um, as though there's a, a hole in the bladder wall. Um, so that's, that's a quite a common thing that people will see and, and think that the bladder is ruptured. Um, if there's no free fluid in the abdomen and um, it appears like that, but the bladder is round, then it is not ruptured because if the bladder is holding its shape, 
um, and there's no free fluid around, then the, the bladder hasn't ruptured. And it's worth looking at that where we imagine there might be a hole to look at that from various different angles um, to just check that that is definitely an artifact. Um, we might see, um, we often see acoustic enhancement below the bladder. So this is where the sound waves passing through the fluid are not attenuated as much. So they have plenty of energy when they hit the tissue and therefore they appear, the tissue appears brighter on the on screen compared to um, tissue at the same depth where the ultrasound waves have only gone through tissue. So this makes it appear much brighter below the bladder and we might need to adjust our time gain compensation um, to account for this. Um, the other artifact that we might see is a slice up thickness artifact. Um, we get that where we have a, um, a, a lumen with, with a, a wall surrounding it and we get this um, area at the bottom of the, the bladder that looks a bit like there might be sludge or sediment, but actually it's an artifact of the, the wall coming up. Signs of pathology to watch out for include um, acoustic shadowing from mineralization or uroliths. So thinking about the urinary bladder anatomy, we've got the two kidneys up here and the ureters coming down to the trigone area in the bladder. And then we've got the cranial part of the bladder here. Um, in males, we've obviously got the prostate um, just caudal to, to, to the bladder. So we, we may see that when we're scanning the bladder. So what are you um, looking for when you're scanning the bladder? The main things that you're uh, really observing for are the wall and the lumen. With the wall, we want to judge the thickness. Um, so the thickness will depend a lot on how full the bladder is. And the bladder wall can appear very thickened if it's almost empty. Um, if it's full, it'll be stretched to, to full capacity and that will be a, give you a better indication if there are focal areas of thickening. Um, we're looking for any protrusions from the bladder wall and we're looking for where the ureters enter. Um, we may be able to see that and we may even be able to see the ureter jet, um, which is quite a fun thing to spot if we do spot it. Um, the, we're also looking at the lumen content, so it should be anechoic, so nice and black, and we should get that um, acoustic enhancement, so brightness below the bladder. Um, but we might see sediment or uroliths, um, and, and that's important to, to take note of. So here's a little video on how to scan the urinary bladder. So I start by scanning from the ventral aspect of the abdomen up towards the spine um, to get a longitudinal view of the bladder. And I fan all the way up and I can see the, the colon here, the descending colon above it. Um, this is in a more longitudinal view. I, I fan all the way up and then I fan all the way down. Until the bladder disappears, then I can be sure that I've seen the whole bladder in that plane. And I rotate the probe 90 degrees. Now I want to get a transverse view. Here we've got the colon beyond in transverse. You can see how this also has an acoustic shadow. Um, so if you apply too much pressure, you might confuse that as a urolith. Um, but you want to fan all the way cranially, all the way cordially. You can see I'm not putting very much pressure on the probe um, because that, that will push the colon into the bladder. An important view to get is the dependent view, so where we're scanning down towards the table through the bladder. And this is because we want to see if any uroliths have fallen to the bottom of the bladder and they'll, they'll present here on, on the far side of the image within the bladder. It also um, is a good view because we're, we're not going to get the colon in the way, so we won't mistake that for a urolith. Um, as the colon is up here behind the probe. Um, so we're not going to get confused with that. And, and if you see something in that dependent portion, would you would you try to get it to move, like by moving your, your patient? Yeah, 
Absolutely. If if it's uroliths, then they're usually quite quite big and obvious. But if there's sediment and you're not sure if that might be slice thickness artifact, for example, a really good thing to do is to just shake the bladder a little bit um, gently as, as the dog will tolerate or the cat will tolerate just to get some movement in that bladder. And that can make the sediment um, move around and it can look like a little snow globe um, and that can give you some really good information. So just to summarize scanning the bladder, we were scanning in left lateral recumbency. Essentially, we could do this in, in both recumb recumbencies. Um, and I often do do them in both recumbencies if, if I'm looking at the bladder specifically. Um, but we're looking in the caudal abdomen. If you can't find the bladder, it's probably more caudal than you're imagining um, because it may be because the bladder's empty and it's just moving up into the pelvic area. So look more caudally if you can't find it. Um, so we, we, we look through the, from, um, from the ventral aspect towards the dorsal aspect and we fan through the bladder towards the left and towards the right. Then we rotate 90 degrees and we fan cranial to caudal. And then with the bladder, it's important to not only get those two planes, but also just to get the dependent view so that we see what gravity is doing within the bladder. So we look through the bladder towards the table. So here we've got some normal images of the bladder. So on the left here, we've got um, a normal bladder with a, a, a thin wall. Um, so that's that's looking very normal. And here we've got a, a moving image. We've got the colon coming into view just here, uh, a bit of a longitudinal view of the of the colon. Um, and we're just fanning through the bladder. There's no content in the bladder. Um, it's all that anechoic um, fluid. So there's no sediment or, or uroliths to see. And the wall is nice and thin. So the common pitfalls that we see with the bladder include mistaking slice thickness artifact for a mass. Um, so um, that's where um, we might have um, done, as you said, Shelley got the bladder to move to try and see if, if that is sediment to get it to move. It's not moving. The thing to do is to try and um, view this from multiple angles. Um, if, if, it's, um, if it's truly thickened wool, um, it's not going to move and you'll be able to see it from different angles. If it's artifact, it will always be, be moving um, the, away from the probe. Um, the other thing is mistaking the colon for a urolith. You could see how um, the colon presented with quite hyperechoic with acoustic shadow beneath. And particularly if you put a bit of pressure on, on the bladder that can sort of push it up towards the colon and uh, the bladder can sort of move around the colon and it can make it appear as though there is a urolith. So it's really important to understand that uroliths will fall, they'll be gravity dependent, um, they will fall to, to the side um, and um, the colon won't do that, it's in quite a fixed position. Um, so just be aware of where you're scanning for that. Yeah, that colon was incredibly bright, and 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 I could totally see how that would mimic a, a big a big uh, urolith. Um, yeah. There. So yeah, something to watch for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so pathology that we're looking out for in the bladder, uroliths and sediment, um, but blood clots as well. Blood clots is a common thing we'll see, um, and we don't want to mistake for soft tissue. So um, blood clots will often be free. Sometimes they do adhere a bit to the, the bladder wall, but often they'll be free and fall um, like the uroliths to the dependent side. Um, and also putting color Doppler on can be really useful because um, if it's a soft tissue um, protrusion, then it, it will usually have some blood flow within it, whereas a blood clot won't have any blood flow within it. Um, and neoplasia is another common thing we see. So moving on to some cases, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the first case we'll look at is Chewy. Chewy's a seven-year-old male neutered Brussels Griffon. He had a history of hematuria, not resolving, um, nothing coming up on bacterial culture. 
um, but had found some calcium oxalate crystals in urinalysis. So this is a little video of, of what I found on scanning. The left kidney appeared normal, as did the right kidney. So we've got normal cortex and medulla here, measuring normal lengths. But when we got to the bladder, um, we came across this hyperechoic structure with acoustic shadow beneath it. We also, in the cranial abdomen, found this um, protruding structure that didn't have an acoustic shadow beneath it. So just here. Um, it's got a, more of an appearance of soft, soft tissue, but we found that it didn't have any flow within it. Um, and it did appear to be fairly mobile as well. So we're assuming that this is a, a blood clot. Again, there's the urolith within the bladder. With its acoustic shadow beneath it. So we've got very hyperechoic and then this acoustic shadow beneath it. And that was measuring at, at 1.5 centimeters again there. So we found these, these two structures within um, within Chewy's bladder. Um, so the, the bladder wall uh, might, might appear slightly thickened, but it was not a very full bladder. Um, I think through constant irritation, he was urinating lots, um, but he had this urolith um, here that was causing an acoustic shadow. And then in, in this area, we could see a, a blood clot as well. He went to surgery and the urolith was removed. Um, and um, there, was, there was no blood clot seen, but there was no other abnormalities. So he may have passed that in before he got to surgery. Do, are, are, are most of the, uh, the urolists that you find in the bladders, are they that size or, or are, they, are they a lot um, smaller? So sometimes they can be smaller, but they can be a lot bigger than that as well. Wow. Um, so yeah, we can often find, find some that are, you know, up to sort of five centimeters in length. Wow. Um, so they can be quite a bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. Um, some that are just definitely never going to pass. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so this is um, the second case, Poppy, who's a 12 year old female neutered domestic shorthead cat. Um, who had bloods indicative of chronic renal failure. So this is what our, our findings were. On the left kidney, um, we have a normal cortex and medulla appears normal, but in between we've got this rather bright hyperechoic area. So we've got a, a, a medullary rim sign um, that, Again, on the right kidney, we could see the cortex, the medulla, and then this bright white band in between. And we can see it's, it's quite thick. Um, it's not just one thin line. It's quite thick and, and fairly poorly defined. Um, and this is seen with, um, with kidney disease. Just to show you the bladder, the bladder appeared um, absolutely normal with a thin wall. Um, so what we had is a corticomedullary rim sign. Um, there is some, uh, there's a recent paper um, out that shows the uh, thicker the, the band or the rim sign is, um, and the less well-defined it is, the more likely it is to be associated with kidney disease. So it's kind of a confirming that we've got actually we've got kidney disease going on here, the, the confirming what the bloods were, were showing as well. Um, but sometimes we can see this in normal animals. It just tends to be um, more well-defined, uh, thinner white line uh, in between the cortex and the, and the medulla. So it's just an interesting finding. Um, it's not pathognomic, um, it is, one of those things that we will sometimes see in normal am animals and sometimes it will back up our case in, in kidney disease as well. 
So our third case is Waffle, a 10 year old female neutered domestic shorthead cat who had hypothyroidism, but we were scanning because she was suffering with diarrhea. We didn't find much on the uh, intestines to help us out with the diarrhea story, but we did find some interesting things on her kidneys. So this was her left kidney here. So quite an interesting structure. So we've got the cortex and the medulla, but there are these indentations, these hyperechoic indentations in the cortex um, that were showing up. And the same was in the right kidney. So we've got the cortex out here, got the medulla in here, and then we've got these hyperechoic um, wedge-shaped structures uh, that were leaving an indentation in the um, margins of the kidney as well. Those are quite striking. Yeah. So bladder was perfectly normal, um, thin wall, anechoic content. So what we are seeing here is renal infarcts. So um, areas of the kidney that have uh, lost blood supply. So you get this wedge shape in the cortex and you get this indentation in the margins of the kidneys. Um, and, and that is a, a renal infarct and they become hyperechoic also. Um, so you might see that if there's um, something causing hypercoagulability and something we need, really need to think about, particularly because this cat has hypothyroidism, is um, whether we've got um, heart disease as well, because that makes it much more likely that we're going to throw blood clots um, and the kidneys is one place where we'll see them. But, you know, more life threateningly, we might see a saddle thrombus as well. So. Um, in, in these cases where we see renal infarcts, it's really important to scan the hearts as well um, to check for, for heart disease, for hyper um, HCM. So Did the kidneys, can the kidneys recover from that? Like, would they ever appear normal again? I, I don't think that would ever appear normal. Those, they're, they're really um, areas of kidney that have died, right. really. Um, they, they, yeah, they've had no oxygen for a, a period of time. And actually, there can be enough kidney left over that the, the kidneys are functioning properly um mm. and you you might not you might not notice it on bloods or or anywhere else um it's something that you would pick up really um, most likely on ultrasound scanning so what are the take-home messages today so we've talked about how to find the left kidney and the right kidney remember that right kidney is further cranial it's under the rib cage um, and the bladder if we're Struggling to find the bladder, it's usually because it's further caudal than you think. What artifacts might confuse you? So slice thickness artifact, um, you can move the, the bladder to see if there's any movement, any sediment there. But if you're worried about it being a tumour, make sure you've um, adjusted your time gain compensation so that um, it, it's not overly overly bright so we're um, not got the gain too high because that that will confuse um, and, and make it appear like like there might be a tumor whereas it is really sliced thickness artifact and the colon versus urolith story so releasing that pressure also getting that dependent view of the bladder um, so that we're not involving the colon at all the pathology that we want to watch out for, thinking about the bladder wall, um, are there any focal areas that are thickened or any protrusions? Uh, the bladder lumen content, is, is it anechoic or are there, is there sediment or are there uroliths within, within it? Um, looking at the kidney parenchyma, are we seeing the normal hyperechoic uh, um, cortex and then the hypoechoic medulla and having a look at that kidney pelvis particularly in transverse view is that dilated at all and the key thing is to go away and practice 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 
um, and you're getting better at spotting what normal is. Thank you so much for listening to me talk this evening. If you have got any questions um, about ultrasound, do pop me an email, camilla at fovu.co.uk. Um, I have popped a free gift for you all on my website. You can claim that at fovu.co.uk forward slash Clarius. It's got my review on the Clarius machine, but it's also got an ebook on how to get started with ultrasound if you're just starting out. So go and go and claim your gift there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. That was awesome. Um, and yeah, just regarding questions, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we just invite you to, to just, you can pop your questions in there now or later. If we don't get to them at the end of the session, we will uh, do our best to respond in an email in the coming days. Um, so now I'm going to um, attempt to follow Dr. Edwards' technique uh, in scanning one of the kidneys and the bladder. And I'm gonna um, kind of take the easy road and, and scan the left kidney um, on our wonderful little guy mountain over here. So um, we'll just take a few minutes to get set up here. Great. Okay, so I've, I've positioned the scanner just right at the costal arch. Yeah. And I'm in, and I'm in long axis here, so. Yeah, uh, just... so we've got a nice view of the, the gallbladder and the liver there. So the gallbladder is here and the liver here. I'm just gonna adjust it, my gain just a little bit brighter here so we can see the liver parenchyma a little bit better. Great, so now I'll just slide down the costal margin. Yep. Okay. Through past the stomach and now I can see the spleen. Stomach is here and this is spleen here. Yep. Okay. So we keep going and then we can, I can see the kidney ah, beyond. Ah, there we go. Uh, Okay, there we go. So this is the kidney right here then. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, that, yeah, it, it, that one wasn't uh, too, too terribly difficult to find. I just kind of slow and steady here, just, just so that exactly. I didn't kind of slide over it. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. so, so we just kind of rotate the scanner just a little bit, just to get the, the best length that we can. Yeah. And then freeze the image, and I'm just going to back up just a couple of little frames here, and then we'll just That's do, nice. a, yeah, we'll just do a length measurement here. Okay, and I'm getting about 4.2 centimeters, which is good because uh, mountains yeah. a little guy, so I think that's normal range, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's perfect size for him. Yeah. So we would do that three, three more, a couple more times, and yeah. just the. Uh, just so that we can take the longest measurement. Yeah. And I'll do one more here. Great, we're getting see, the same. See if you can, I like to challenge myself to see if I can beat my previous. So. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I've got exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, that now shows you, you put it right. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you find the color Doppler valuable when you're looking at the kidneys? Um, Yes, it can absolutely. Um, yeah. It can show you. Um, Is it something yeah. that you would pop on routinely, or or not? Not necessarily? not routinely. Usually, okay. if I'm I'm concerned about something within the kidneys, and and it's useful um, for for looking at the landmarks, finding the aorta right. and renal artery nearby. So okay, good. So now I'll rotate the scanner ninety degrees. Yep. Oh, okay, buddy. <laughs> so tired of me. Oh, it's okay, sweetie. Good boy. Good boy. All right. Oh, mountain. Now I have to find your kidney again. <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay. So I'll rotate 90 degrees here. Okay. So now I'm seeing the kidney in cross section here. Yep. It's up there. That's nice. Great. And then we'll just scan cranially and then caudally. Yeah. So that we get the whole the whole kidney. That's right. Great. Then we've seen the whole kidney in two planes. Yeah. Like we do with x-ray, getting getting two planes is is yeah. really useful. Makes sense. You can kind of get a 3D idea in your in your head, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
roughly. Okay, so now I'm just going to see if I can find mountain splatter here. So if we have the probe a little bit more parallel to the table um, initially. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it. So pointing up towards the spine. Great. Okay. Good. So I'm in, I'm in long axis, so I'm just going to fan over to his left and then all the way over to the right. And is that, that the colon that I'm seeing there? That bright Absolutely. echo? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the colon. Yeah, and I mean, we're not getting too much artifact there, but if I was to, to turn up the game and gain and try and um, mimic what you were talking about with the um, with the artifact, it would be this yeah. this here that looks like sediment, but in fact, it's it's just the um, exactly yeah. yeah the artifact. So so we'll just be aware of that and bring down our gain, and I could push the bladder a little bit, try and wiggle that around, and it doesn't happen. So so we're we're convinced that yeah. that's not anything anything real. Exactly. And if you apply a bit of pressure there where the where the colon is as well, mm -hmm. you can see how how that can easily sort of mm. appear like it's inside the bladder. Yeah, as well. for sure. Yeah. All right. So again, I'm going to rotate the scanner 90 degrees. OK, yeah. And there there that colon really looks like a <laughs> yeah, like something more sinister. But yeah, exactly. so on close exam, yeah. it's definitely outside the bladder. Yeah. Great. So I'm just starting cranially and yeah. sweeping all the way down. Yeah. To the That's base great. of the trigone of the bladder. Yeah. Now, so is this, until yeah. it disappears, which is really good. Yeah. Yeah. And now is this the prostate that we're seeing here? Um, it, it could be possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm kind of off to the side a little bit there, but yeah. All right. Good. So that's a pretty good exam of the bladder. And then you said yeah. sometimes you can look for uh, for urinary jets. I don't know if we'll see any mountains pretty full no, here already, but uh, yeah, can, sometimes sometimes we can see that even without color Doppler. Yes. Just, um, just a bit of movement within the yeah. bladder, um, right. but color Doppler can can help see this jet coming from the ureter into the bladder. Great. Um, okay. Yeah, and then and then the dependent view of the bladder is oh, the, yes, right. the key one. Don't forget okay. that, Shelley. <laughs> ah, I did. <laughs> okay, so so now I'm going to just point the the scanner straight down at the bed. Yeah. And and so now this area here will be yeah. the dependent portion of the bladder, correct? Exactly at the bottom of the image. Yeah, right. absolutely. And yeah, we don't we don't see that um uh, that colon artifact anymore either all well, uh, over the exactly. other side but yeah 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 cool. so, that's great. so then if i saw something there then I, could, I would try and move it around or wiggle it around a little bit and and, and possibly um try the other uh recumbency position and just see if we could get any to move right absolutely yes oh, yeah great okay yeah. either moving the bladder or moving the dog um so try and right. see yeah okay all right. Excellent. Good. Thank you, Mountain. That was really awesome. I'll leave that for you. <laughs> Great. So, you know, as you can see, I, I'm not a I'm not a vet. I'm not a vet ultrasound tech, but uh, if you kind of know what to look for and you have your landmarks and just kind of take your time systematically um, and go through the techniques that Dr. Edwards has mentioned, it's uh, it's it's not that difficult, um, but yeah, like she said, just it, practice, 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 and pattern recognition, and and, and it will get uh, it will get much easier. So, how can POCUS help your veterinary practice? Um, have it in in house to, or you can have sorry, you can have access to ultrasound to speed up your diagnosis on the first visit. So you're eliminating um, your your patients having to come back. Um, you're going to get better clinical results with more rapid patient treatment. Um, it's app-based, so it's easy to learn and easy to use. Um, you can take the scanner to the cage side um, or, or to wherever you're going, wherever your patient is. And so it's very low impact with minimal restraint. As you can see, uh, you know, Mountain was very cooperative and uh, he's, he's normally a pretty energetic little guy. 
um, word of mouth referrals, client satisfaction and revenues. And that's a big one. So just before I kind of close off here, um, I'll just read you a little quote from uh, Dr. Lori Keeler. Um, we purchased the Clarius ultrasound because it was the most economical and the easiest to use. You don't have to fiddle with a whole lot of settings. You just turn it on and you start your ultrasound. And, you know, we have specific um, scanners for veterinary medicine, as well as very specific presets. So there isn't a lot of adjusting. You just, you just, you know, I like to call it very plunkable. You, you start scanning and away you go. So now I'd like to just hand it back to Janesse. Thank you so much, Shelley, for that live demonstration. Uh, so much fun using our third generation Clarius C7 vet wireless ultrasound scanner. And a big thank you to Dr. Edwards for sharing your best practices with us today. And of course, thank you to Mountain and his human Julian for the live demonstration. Before we begin our live Q&A, so please do enter your questions using the questions icon. Uh, we do have a question for you first, though. The poll is an opportunity to learn more about our new third generation Claris wireless ultrasound scanners for your veterinary practice. These scanners are available in select regions um, and available in a variety of different currencies as well. So if you'd like pricing and availability for your region, please do select this option. Again, you can select all that apply. So if you'd also like to opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound for your veterinary practice, please select that. Uh, if you'd like to discuss scanner features, you can select that option as well. You can book a live virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action and have it be more of an interactive demo where you ask questions and we can look at specific things uh, with one of our clinical experts. Um, and we can also send you more video tutorials uh, like the ones um, that were highlighted in today's session. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. While you do that, I'll take a minute to tell you about our newly released HD3 version of our Claris Vet scanners for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnosis for small, medium and large animals. Our C7 HD3 micro convex vet scanner, which you saw in action today, is specifically designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have our C3 convex vet for larger animals and the L7 linear vet for equine MSK. Now 30% smaller and lighter, more affordable with an enclosed battery, our third generation family of vet scanners are available in select regions and deliver several advantages. Clarius HD3 is unrivaled for high resolution imaging and handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets. Clarius shows you the fine details you need to investigate an area of concern, perform a fast exam, or make a confident diagnosis at your patient's first visit to expedite the right treatment plan. Each scanner is designed with eight beam formers, not one, but eight beam formers and 192 elements that deliver the image quality and speed only found in traditional system, but at a fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Claris is also wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals where they are, from the vet clinic to their homes. You get free movement with no more wires getting in the way or startling the animals, also making the scanners easier and faster to clean and disinfect. Only Claris delivers scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices with free updates. Available with our new membership, Clarius Cloud is available to capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership includes in-app Clarius classroom videos with experts and onboarding with Clarius clinicians to build your ultrasound scanning skills. And Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. The new advanced veterinary package offers more flexibility for users who need additional and advanced workflows for various animal examinations, for example, to access uh, finely tuned presets categorized by application and anatomy. For clinicians who prefer a one-time purchase over a membership, the advanced uh, veterinary package is available as an add-on purchase as, as well as being included in the membership. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Clarius HD3 vet scanner, which is ultra affordable. I'll let you uh, take two more seconds here to close the poll out and uh, select any more options that you like. Two, one. Thank you for participating. We'll get back to you in the coming week.
Let's now begin our live Q&A. Please use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions for Dr. Edwards. And because it's a common question, I do want to let everyone know that in the coming days, we'll email you a recording of today's webinar, as well as a copy, uh, PDF copy of the presentation. Um, we will also be sending you a link to the vet show to redeem your CE or CPD credits. Now that may just take a few days. I'd like to welcome back Shelly to moderate our live Q&A and, and Dr. Edwards as well. Welcome back. Great, Great. thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions and we don't have a lot of time yet. So um, yeah, as Janice mentioned, we will get back to you if we don't get to your question today. Um, but yeah, so the first question, um, Dr. Edwards, given that uh, chronic renal disease is the most frequent disease in vet med, would you advise a renal scan as part of a well cat check? especially in a geriatric cat? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure if there's any studies done, but it is possibly something that we should be doing. Um, it may help in, in screening, um, but um, I have to say that um, chronic renal disease, we won't always see anything obvious on the kidneys. Um, so, um, it's not going to pick up on, on every case. But yes, um, if you're picking up, um, if you're doing a well cat check blood test um, in your geriatric cats and it's picking up um, a change in the renal values, then I, I would pop a scanner on those cats, certainly, um, to have a look at the kidneys. But as a general thing, uh, I'm not sure we've got the evidence for that at the moment. Um, would you recommend uh, for moving from scanning the kidneys to follow through and find the adrenal glands? And that's interesting because we did uh, do a uh, webinar with Dr. Edwards of the adrenal glands. So. Yeah. So usually um, in, in the process that I've got, I move from the left kidney um, onto the aorta, but I usually go quarterly to the um, medial iliac lymph nodes first and then move cranially again to the left adrenal. And, and that's usually just because when I move from the kidney down to the aorta, um, I don't know um, always, sometimes it, it, I know I can see that I'm in the right place, but I'm not entirely sure whether I need to move cordially to find the left, uh, the renal artery and the left adrenal or cranially. So I prefer to move all the way cordially and then follow the aorta all the way cranially so I can be sure that I haven't missed the left renal artery. Thank you. So I want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time and we are at the top of the hour. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. And yeah, like I said, if we didn't get to your questions, we will have uh, someone from our team, um, myself or Dr. Edwards, uh, follow up with you in the coming days. Thank you so much for attending. Yes, and we've had dozens and dozens of questions, so we will get back to you um, in the coming week. Um, again, you will receive a copy of the slides and webinar recording as well, so do keep an eye on your inbox. To conclude, I'd like to thank the star of our show, Dr. Camilla Edwards, and our furry supporting characters, Pippi and Mountain. A big thank you to Shelley uh, for hosting and for the live scanning, and a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again in a future webinar. Thank you again and keep scanning.